pleasure to be here and uh, it's nice to speak just after Tafeta and Munia because I will not have to re-explain, I will re-explain but you will understand I'm sure, the modulation power spectrum. So I will present you some experiment and a preliminary work that I did with uh, Stephen and uh, Philip Dubin at McGill um, during my first year of postdoc uh, last year. So it's about the modulation power spectrum that I will first begin by uh, summarizing classical sum representation. I'm sure you're, you know, but it's always better to just remind that. After that, I will reintroduce the third time the modulation power spectrum a little bit differently, but uh, again, and then how to filter this representation. And then I will present you the results of uh, two experiments where we try to understand which spectral sample modulation are relevant for the recognition of musical instrument. So I uh, will first begin by classical sound uh, representation. So the most obvious one is of course the waveform, which corresponds to the pressure which is recorded by the microphones, for example, and from a more biological point of view, which is tra transmitted by the peripheral auditory system. And lots of, lots of timber descriptor have been defined from this very simple representation, like the attacks of the envelope of the sound. But the main drawback is, of course, that it doesn't represent the spectral content of the sound. So to um, represent the spectral content, most of the researchers use time frequency representations, like the short-term Fourier transform, and which represents the evolution of the frequency contents over time. So lots of timber uh, descriptors have been also defined from this kind of representation, like in the timber toolbox uh, already presented by Geoffroy. And it's also interesting because it's also close from what is performed in the auditory system in the basilar membrane. Even if here the frequency is linear and uh, in the uh, basilar membrane, it's analyzed, analyzed with a logarithmic scale, close to a logarithmic scale. And, um, but the question is now how to go further. So we use the, the same kind of approach maybe as uh, in previous talk. So we based on the physiology of the ear and we observe that the waveform corresponds to the peripheral system, that the time frequency representation, either logarithmic or linear, uh, globally corresponds to what happened on the cochlea in the basilar membrane. And so we can look at what happened just after maybe uh, the step after uh, the cochlear processing. So namely the more modulation per spectrum. And as it has been uh, presented just previously by Munia, it has been shown that the primary auditory cortex fire according to specific acoustic features and namely spectral and temporal modulation. So I will try to re-explain you the modulation for spectrum again, but differently. So globally the concept is to do a two-dimensional Fourier transform of the short-term Fourier transform, as Tafeta also used. And here we use the linear frequency scale. So if first I do, I consider this spectrogram, sorry, which corresponds to um, an harmonic complex, uh, which is regularly spaced in frequency and in time. So each uh, harmonic complex is separated from one second. And if we first uh, do the frequency trans uh, Fourier transform with, with, with respect to time, sorry, it's not readable, really but if we do the Fourier transform with, with respect to time, we observe that there is a maximum at one hertz because each uh, harmonic complex is separated by one second. And here I only represented the positive rates, but I know because the Fourier transform have also negative uh, values, but here I will only present the positive values. And if no, we do the Fourier transform with respect to the frequency. So as the harmonic complex is regularly spaced in frequency, we also observe a maximum at uh, one uh, cycle per hertz here, as the, the scale is linear. And as uh, it has been said previously, and it's a joint time frequency representation, we can compute first uh, the Fourier transform with respect to time, and then in a row the Fourier transform with respect to the frequency and computed what is <coughs> called the modulation for <coughs> But as you saw, maybe it's not really uh, easy to understand to what it corresponds from an acoustical point of view. And the way to understand the role of scales, so spectral modulation can also sometimes be named scales, 
and rate <coughs> the perception of a sound is to filter this representation. So, um, what would happen if we only keep the scale? So basically, it corresponds to the first, the first uh, time slice, uh, rate slices here. What happens if we uh, only keep this, um, this slices? So I will play you the song corresponding to this spectrogram. And if we only keep the scale, finally we remove the temporal modulation of the initial sound. But we keep its frequency content, and, uh, which could be associated maybe to some timber aspect. And conversely, if we now only keep the rates, we will only keep the temporal shape or the dynamic of the sound. So I will not play you again the original, but just the filtered one. So it corresponds just to keep the first line of the modulation power spectrum. So yes, so you, you see that this representation um, integrates both a spectral and temporal aspect, and by filtering it, we can understand maybe uh, uh, which part of this representation is relevant. I will just present you two other examples to maybe make it more clear what the modulation per spectrum is. So I will play you a first cello sound with a small tremolo vibrator. And if we only keep the spectral modulation, you will see that we can demodulate this uh, cello sound. So there are some artifacts due to the reconstruction processes that I will explain after, but we recognize the timber of the cello. And another example, which is more linked to, which, uh, to what I did during my PhD, but like friction sound that Solvi uh, played you yesterday. So which corresponds to an action which is rubbing on an object. We can extract these two uh, components by filtering either the rate <coughs> or just keeping the spectral modulation. So we clearly listen the contribution of these two uh, dimensions of the initial sound. So what are the perceptually relevant spectral and temporal modulation? Here we interest uh, mainly principally to uh, musical sounds and um, to do that we use the this analysis by synthesis scheme which is inspired by previous Tafeta's work. I will explain you just briefly. So from an original sound we can compute its spectral line. We only keep the modulus of the spectral line and then we do the two-dimensional Fourier transform as I presented uh, previously and then we can multiply this modulation power spectrum by a two-dimensional Gaussian uh, window, which will only keep one part of the modulation per spectrum. And then we can reverse the process by resynthesizing a filtered spectrogram, which, which is only um, which is a real number, not a complex one, because we lost the phase previously. And then to reconstruct a waveform, we can here, we use the Griffinelli algorithm, which is an iterative process that enables to reconstruct the phase only from the modulus of the spectrogram. And then just to conv convince you that it works, I will just play you an original and a resynthesized sound without the filtering steps. So the original cello and the resynthesized one. Maybe the level would be different. Yeah, the level is different, but the resynthesis is uh, nearly perfect when there are no filtering. So, what we did, we, um, to evaluate which part of the MPLS is relevant, we inspired from the bubbles method developed by Gosselin and Shines. Uh, it was initially developed for visual studies to uh, understand which part of a face is relevant to identify the gender of someone of, or the expressivity of someone. And so we sampled the MPS plane by what they call bubble, but which is actually two-dimensional Gaussian filters. And we asked the subject to identify the instrument from a degraded but filtered version of the initial sound. So I could, I can show you maybe after if we have time several examples of different filtering, but I will just go further in the experiment. Mm. 
So we did two experiments based on this uh, methodology. We used, uh, in each one, we used uh, five arpeggios from the Vienna Symphonic uh, Library. And in the first experiment, we only focused on sustained instrument sounds, like the trombone, the tuba, Experiment, we focused on what we call impulsive instrument sounds like the viola pizzicato, the guitar, harp, vibraphone, and marimba. So uh, we ask a musician only in this experiment to identify a filtered version of this uh, original stimuli. Um, so for each, uh, the design of the experiment was composed of 480 triodes, so like five instruments multiplied by 96 filters, which responds to 12 rates and uh, eight spectral modulations. And then we asked the subject to identify the played uh, instrument. So I will now explain you how do we analyze the data. So here you see um, the filter which is a changing of position. And for each filter, the subject responds and could uh, and can say a correct response or a wrong response. And we just send the correct response on the, on the mask and the wrong, fil the, the wrong filters on the, another mask. And then we compute what Gosselin and Shine's called the proportion mask, and which basically corresponds to the ratio between the sum of the correct filters with the sum of all the filters. And finally, it represents the relative influence of uh, each part of the MPS for the recognition of the instrument. So, um, from this proportion mask, we compute what we call the, a salience mask, and which is basically just the p-value of the one tailed test to the mean of the proportion mask there is in here. Yeah. And uh, here you can see the salience mask, so the yellow spots yellow, brown, maybe, yeah. It responds to um, the most salient parts of the um, of this modulation per spectrum, for example, but to the lowest p-values, and the bluest parts corresponds to the highest values, highest p-values of, um, of this salience mask, and the dashed line is just to notify you the significant uh, threshold of uh, 0.05. And we also computed the confusion matrix, of course, uh, between the different instruments. So concerning the sustained instrument, uh, it's interesting to observe if we combine all the instruments that low rates and low spectral modulation convey uh, the most important information. And it's the same for the trombone, globally, the clarinet, and the cello, and almost the tuba. But, but we observed that the saxophone have a very different uh, silence mask than the uh, other instrument. So it's interesting to make that in relationship to the confusion matrix uh, in which we can show that um, all the instruments have been identified above chance significantly and that confusion, but that confusion appears between several instruments like the tuba, between the tuba and the trombone, not between the trombone and the tuba and between the cellos and the saxophone. And if we now look at what we call the confusion mask, so I didn't introduce you in the data analysis because it's very close from the salience mask, it just corresponds to the parts, for example, if we look at the cello saxophone confusion mask, it corresponds to the trial of the cello that has been associated to the saxophone uh, sound. And what we observe is that the confusion mask of the cello with the saxophone corresponds to the salience mask of the saxophone. And we observe the same kind of things for the of results for the saxophone to the cello. It's a little bit different for the tuba and the trombone, but as the tuba has been confused with the trombone, but not the trombone with the tuba, maybe the process is the process is uh, is different. Um, yeah. So concerning the second experiment, we observe the same kind of, uh, of results. If we consider all the instruments uh, together, the low rates and low spectral modulation are the most relevant uh, regions. But if we look at the instruments separately, we observe that some of them have uh, specific 
spectrotemporal modulation uh, regions that are the most salient for their recognition. And the confusion matrix provides some kind of results, even if the R has not been really well identified at 40 percent, but all have are significant level of chance. And confusions appear between guitar and harp, which is not really surprising, and between marimba and vibraphone. But uh, yes, all these confusions appear. And if we look at the confusion mask, we observe the same kind of a relationship with the salience mask, which are that, for example, it works very well for the harp and the guitar. The confusion mask of harp to guitar occur nearly perf not perfectly, but very well corresponds to the guitar salience mask, and the same thing for the harp. And uh, it's also worked for the vibraphone and the marimba, even if the significant part of the confusion mass for the marimba to vibraphone is smaller than on the other um, confusion mass. So I can now play you um, examples of sounds that have been filtered with the most salient region. So just before, I want to explain you uh, that you will not sometimes recognize the instrument, but you will identify the acoustic properties that has been uh, used by the subject to discriminate between them. Okay. And for example, for the uh, saxophone, you will probably not recognize the saxophone sounds, but as it has been confused with the cello, subject use, uh, maybe, that we concluded from this video at the moment, use uh, small parts of the saxophone MPS to discriminate from the cello one. So we begin by the trombone. So this is this part of the bass, the clarinet, the tuba, okay, so that's more weird, the cello, the saxophone, oops, okay, so that's what I said, you didn't recognize the saxophone, but that's normal because uh, it's just this part which doesn't overlap with just the cello's one. So this is certainly this acoustic information which has been used by the subject to discriminate from the cello. So this is really important. Maybe there is a context effect that we are trying to evaluate in new experiments. And for uh, impulsive instruments, so for the viola pizzicato, the guitar, the harp, So to summarize um, this result, so this experiment showed that we can identify uh, instruments from very degraded versions, so which is really in line from an experiment that Clara Suet presented yesterday, and the experiment that she did with uh, Vincent Isner uh, more recently. And globally, uh, this showed that instruments are identified at low rates and low spectral modulation frequencies. Nevertheless, specific spectrotemporal modulation characterized instrument when confusion appears. So this is here where we have to evaluate whether there is a context effect. So that's what I wrote just after. And it seems that we can focus on different parts of the MPRS in order to discriminate closed sounds. So this is maybe in relationship with uh, Munia studies and short-term plasticity of um, these specific parts in the brain. We don't know, but it may be linked to this kind of study. And as uh, it has been concluded in previous uh, presentation, this mainly showed that the modulation power spectrum is a relevant uh, tool to uh, assess the identification of musical instruments. So we have several ongoing works, ongoing uh, works. So um, we are trying to use this kind of representation to explain um, behavioral results of uh, other experiments that have been done by uh, Stephen uh, in the lab last year. And what is interesting with this kind of representation is that it stresses different invariants of the uh, spectrogram, either with a logarithmic frequency scale or linear frequency scale. So by considering the linear frequency scale, it highlights uh, invariants by, by translation in the spectrogram. And if we consider a logarithmic frequency scale, it highlights uh, invariance per dilation. So here we use linear frequency scales due to engineering problem for reconstruction, but it would be also interesting to do the same kind of experiment with a logarithmic frequency scale. 
and another uh, hopefully uh, um, perspective of this work would be to define new timber descriptors based on this representation which does not mean that previous descriptors are wrong, we are not saying that the ATX is useless, but maybe all other descriptors which integrate the ATX and maybe other dimensions of timber could be defined from this kind of representation as it integrates both spectral and temporal uh, modulation. So thank you for your attention, and I also want to thank uh, Grace one who helped me to run the subject of this experiment. Thank you for your attention. I think maybe we can even derive maybe uh, acoustic relevant acoustic information from this part of the spectrum. And I think it's also maybe in link in relation with the result of your paper where you show that there are different parts of even for high rates and high uh, uh, scales that are used to describe dimensions of the of the timber space. Yeah, so I guess the difference is so when when the study was done on speech Speech is mostly concentrated in the bottom lower half of the spectrum. Now that you're looking at the different instruments and they tend to be on the edge, does it make you rethink how you sample your mm. short-term Fourier transform? Because now you're sort of on the edge of the modulation that is suggested there is more interesting stuff beyond. Yeah. You need to resample your short-term Fourier transform. I agree with you, but uh, that's not an issue with speech. Speech tends to be here, so it's fine. But even the gender in speech is higher. It's true, true. but it, I don't think it reaches yeah. those borders. No, no. no. The, no. My, yeah, my thoughts yeah. were in yeah. the science. I think it's <laughs> because there is a context effect, because the uh, subject had to discriminate between sounds, and uh, you, you listen that when you filter in low modulation, spectral and temporal modulation, the reconstruction is nearly perfect. So to make the uh, discrimination, the base just on several um, different acoustic description, descriptors, and the descriptors but acoustic information. But uh, yes, that's surprising, but if we look at all instruments combined, it's um, reassuring that low rates and low spectral modulation are the most relevant. But I can maybe just show you because... Uh, they just suggest that you may be missing something else going on there because you have samples your short-term we use the um, based on the uncertainty principle okay. uh, with the same uh, properties as in the paper of for speech perception. We use the same uh, the same parameters. But maybe I can just show you um, what happens if we filter in different parts of the uh, of the spectrum. Yes, uh, I want to record. Okay, so here we can uh, filter the sound. Oh, it's very different. <laughs> okay, but here you see um, the modulation per spectrum, and it's the <coughs> one of uh, two bands. We will check that. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, uh, it's a trombone. And if we uh, change the size of the bubble, you will listen that it's completely different. And if now we position it on low scale and low rise. Okay. 
But I think there are lots of uh, not issues, but uh, bias that have been to be evaluated in uh, follow-up experiments, like the size of the bubbles. Doing that with multiple bubbles, I think uh, Clara will have, but they are trying to do that on spectrogram. And um, with a di slightly different methodology, but maybe this is biased, but we have to evaluate in our experiment. But yes, if we filter in this part, there are not enough energy in the original modulation for spectrum, but it's even used by the subject to make the discrimination. I'm not sure you recognize it wrong, but. <laughs> So, so in the yeah. context when you have more instruments, it may be you're saying that listeners queue in on features that they otherwise wouldn't have used. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, we were thinking to do that for one instrument category, uh, but we need to use only expert uh, subject. But if we remove the, uh, maybe the cello, maybe the saxophone, the most salient region will shift and the loud scale and lower it because they, are, they will not have been confused with the with the other instrument. But yes, maybe if we increase the number of instruments, it will uh, make more spread uh, results uh, for each, um, each of these. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.